Well, hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Zittrain. I'm so pleased to be here with Ethan Gilsdorf uh, to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, Life and the Law. Um, just so everybody knows, we are being webcast live to an indeterminate number of people. And maybe it's determined, but secret, but a, a number of people. There's food in the back, so if you're not on the webcast, you should help yourself to some <laughs> snacks. And uh, anything you say can and will be preserved forever and indexed and referenced back to you. So uh, geek pride, be ready to own the fact that you have come to this event. Um, so, uh, so pleased uh, to have you here, uh, Ethan. And uh, before you uh, started on a little bit of an opener, just tell us a little bit about how you came to write Fantasy Freaks and Gaming Geeks, an epic quest for reality among role players, online gamers, and other dwellers of imaginary realms. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to the Burlington Center. Thanks to Harvard. Thanks to the PowerPoint. Should I start today quick? Dan's going to work on making it so your computer doesn't oh, think that you are idle if you should not be near it for even should five seconds. Back? Yes. We'll go to the beginning. Well, you're sort of telegraphing things. I know, I'm sorry. Yes. There we go. That's the, that's it just shows you that geekiness in one area does not translate to geekiness in other areas. I forgot to check the seat. Ma'am, turn on your radio. Turn on your radio. Yeah. There, right, right there. There we go. There. Did something happen? Did I get louder? <laughs> Do I sound more authoritative? Um, so thank you again. Now we're officially mic'd. I'll do that again. Thanks again, uh, Jonathan. Thank you to the Berkman Center and to Harvard for inviting me here. Um, we had a wonderful adventure on our way over here from your office, which included going through the secret tunnels. Yeah, I told him we had to take the tunnels. To I don't get know if I'm allowed to say that, but it turns out there are secret tunnels beneath the law school here, and they look exactly like the corridors of my high school <laughs> in Durham, New Hampshire. It's a bit weird. Um, and that actually is a good, <clears throat> a good, excuse me, a good starting point for the story about my book, uh, Fantasy Freaks and Gaming Geeks. So I'm, I'm a journalist, uh, a memoirist, um, a recovering poet, uh, and other other hats I've worn. But uh, so if you lapse into pentameter, we'll exactly you out. you'll understand exactly some kind of heroic couplets about yeah. my 17th level paladin or something. Um, so the, the origin of, of of my book, Fantasy Freaks and Gaming Geeks, really comes from that time actually of high school when I was uh, a young geekling or a geek in training and, and played a ton of Dungeons and Dragons um, uh, in the 70s. And, and how the, did you get introduced 80s. to it, by the way? Did you see an ad in the back of a magazine? Was there an older brother character? It was that... sort of like an older brother. It turned yeah. out to be a neighbor. This is one of these classic stories, I think, for those people in the audience who've, who play D&D &D or who played D&D. &D. Uh, we should just ask, how Actually, many we people should do that, yeah. are former D&Ders? What's that? Just former. just former. Let's start with the just yeah, yeah, former. Just former. We're going to out the former, and then we'll, we'll out the. Then we'll out For the, the record, the... Bruce Schneier is already working out the Venn diagram that <laughs> of these questions. So, how many people are uh, former D and Ders? Yeah. How many people are current D and Ders? Wow. All right, a number. How many people are just D and D curious and haven't played? <laughs> okay, that's. Uh, let the record right. show. It's about a third, a third, a third. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty good. That's right, a nice. Go that's a nice spread. I don't know. So if you I had get this that. neighbor. Had this neighbor. So the classic story for many of us is that somebody taught us how to play. You know, if you if you did play the game or, or or um, remember the origin story for your gaming experience, it's it's really hard to walk into the hobby shop and pick up the book and just start reading it and playing it. I know lots of friends who bought the books and never played, but they loved just reading the books. You know, but they just didn't have anyone to play with or they couldn't figure out how it would really happen. It's kind of one of these games that you play by doing. So. Uh, long story short, a friend of uh, a, a neighbor in my in my uh, neighborhood, in my small little town in in rural New Hampshire, uh, about an hour and change north of here, just you know moved into the neighborhood out of nowhere. It was like one of these magical moments. New kid in the on the block has a different experience, comes from a different part of the world, and he says, "Have you ever played this?" So game? far, this is the plot of the Stephen King book, Needful Things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, it gets better. Um, <laughs> and and he he said, "Have you ever played this game, Dungeons and Dragons, before?" And of course, I hadn't. Never heard of it at that point. This was 1979, so I was uh, 12, or just about to turn 12. It was the summer of 1979, and um, we literally just entered into this, you know, classic, you know, uh, uh, teacher-student relationship. And he, he and you brought the rest of your friends along, or were, was... it started out with a very small core group. This yeah. is I was in eighth grade, or just about to enter eighth grade. Two or three kids in the neighborhood played, and then 
that next year was the, was the high school year and we joined up with other, other kids. We found each other somehow through the, before the internet. This is again, for those of you out there who don't understand what life might have been like before the internet, um, the, you know, you, it was by ch chance encounters that you would meet fellow gamers. It was a little harder to... to chance to, encounters at the hobby store. Exactly, right. Chance <laughs> encounters. You roll onto your... It was your, just in the neighborhood. You roll on your, your, your wandering geek chart, and if a geek happens to wander by in gym class, then you, you give him the, or her, in my case, him, the, the signal, and then, and then maybe, maybe you talk about something later. So we, we found a few other people in, in the little town that I grew up in, which was adjacent to a, a university town, which helped. This is in Durham, New Hampshire, which is where the University of New Hampshire is. And it really started from there. And I got completely, completely sucked into playing this game. And were your folks cool with it? or? Uh... Yeah, they were fine with it. I think that um, it beat the alternative, which was... Uh, meth? Yeah, exactly, meth, or you know, in those days, probably... I don't Cigarettes? Know, beer or something. Yeah. Um, and, and it kept me sort of you know, under watchful eyes. And, and we literally had a, a regular gaming group gaming night every Friday um, from about eighth grade till senior year in high school I played with these guys uh -huh. 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. and my parents knew where I was and other parents knew where their kids were and it was all very cool so we weren't driving around um, you know getting into trouble and they they thought it was cool they thought it was they didn't really understand it of course parents never really did they would you know I would play the game and come up at night and, and someone would say so who won you know <laughs> who won the game of D's and does, or whatever you know, they just had no conception. Uh -huh. uh, so for me, it was it was a really important game for my for me in my development, and I was quite shy and introverted kid at the time, and I didn't have a, a whole lot of social skills. Uh, still working on that as well uh, as a forty seven year old. But um, the the that was kind of like the gateway for me to, into a whole world of of this kind of stuff, and of course it, it accompanies Tolkien and it accompanies other kinds of yes. fantasy and science fiction. And then uh, largely, I gave it up. I really. Kind of this went away to put away childish things. Put away childish things phase, which happened uh, a discovering girls having a girlfriend senior year in high school and going off to a certain alternative liberal arts college in Western Massachusetts and deciding that I didn't of want. Of which there are about seven to choose. Exactly right, <laughs> uh, where I didn't want to be, you know, for whatever reasons, wrongly I think uh, now retrospectively, I, I had attached some negative connotations to that time of my life, and I really wanted to be a new guy. I wanted to, you know, be this sort of cooler guy I wanted to be a filmmaker it was all about magic the gathering at that exactly point. right <laughs> right <laughs> totally left that behind and uh, and and I really had completely uh, left it behind for many years and then long story short uh, around the time I turned 40 I discovered Lord of the Rings rediscovered it through the movies and then I found we'll see a couple slides here of, of some of my stuff that I had literally forgotten about some of my yeah. old Dungeons and Dragons paraphernalia so show us which sat in the box um, so uh, we'll, we'll take a, I guess a short little tour here this is um, uh, a quote, actually, that, that you found that uh, maybe you can introduce. <laughs> yeah, uh, for those that are merely curious, and I credit <laughs> Bruce Schneier with having remembered yeah. it nearly verbatim. Yeah. Um, so that's a little a way in. So what is D&D? For those of you who don't know, I think most of you do know what it is. Um, but I'll just say before I, I, I sort of go into the historical part, just to remind everyone that this is the 40th anniversary of the game. It's an important year for the hobby. It's an important year for, I think, a lot of people who are around my age who were in their 40s and now we're thinking back about what were our formative experiences. Um, it was really the first commercially available, it was the first commercially available role-playing game. Of course, kids have been playing Cops and Robbers and you know, Princess and Prince and Cowboys and Indians and other non-PC role-playing type games, but never with a rule set, never with a, a, a strict kind of game rule set. And so the, the key being here, this, this innovation of that you play the game with some dice and some maps, but largely it's happening here in your minds, in the creative, collective you know, imaginations of those people seated around the table, and that you really do play it face to face, or in the case of young adolescent boys, you're not really making eye contact with each other, but you're sort of making eye contact with them. Uh, and there's a referee called the Dungeon Master who, who is sort of the arbiter, the rule, rule setter, the world builder, and, and we might talk and a little bit later about- from one game to another? And it can, or? I mean, typically you would, you would play with the same Dungeon Master and the same group of players for more than one night. And we would play games, what we would call campaigns, if you're not familiar with the lingo, which is the other big innovation of the game. It's not like Risk or Monopoly where you play three or four hours, in the case of Risk, seven, eight hours, 25 hours, whatever it took you to finally you know, make your last stand in Australia or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> to materialize. Uh, that that you know, the game did have an ongoing story, and that it didn't have to end. You know, at eleven o'clock when your curfew hit, you could you could park the story in, in neutral and come back to it a week later. And that was the kind of the real appeal for 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 me. I, and in between the game, there was all kinds of things I could do in my mind, and I could draw maps, and I could continue to 
sort of inhabit this world that I'd created. And sometimes when I was the dungeon master, that was what was so much fun for me, was, 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 in, was creating those, those worlds mm -hmm. and imagining that. In other cases, I enjoyed being the player. Um, and of course, it's this elaborate, uh, what, I, what I think now, in retrospect, really important formative experience for me in terms of teaching me about, about creativity and storytelling. Um, and and when, when we talk about D&D &D in this presentation, I think what I mean to say is just all role-playing games. It's just easier to say D&D. D&D is the one that I got hooked on. But for those of you... So that's avoiding a denominational war. Exactly, right, yeah. yeah. And, and there's all kinds of rule uh, arguments and sort of, you know, skirmishes amongst different factions who prefer different versions of D&D, &D, and then there's a whole other battle to be fought about. Is is D and D, you know, been surpassed by other role playing yeah. games? And then it's it's really genre agnostic at this point. You can play a role playing game and choose your milieu. You know, the Wild West, James Bond, steampunk. You know, um, it would be interesting if there were a Google Translate kind of thing, so that people could play the same campaign, but each act would be translated to their milieu. That's a good, that's a cool idea. I like that. It's called yeah. GURPS. GURPS. There you go. Um, <laughs> Once again, Bruce Schneier knows more than me. <laughs> um, GURPS. And so this is the, this is the, um, some of the ephemera from my world when I was, uh, I don't have a photo of it in the pre presentation, but the, the Kickstarter for this book, this, this book, Fantasy Freaks and Gaming Geeks, was this sort of er moment of, of being around 40 and, and going to my parents' basement, of course. Where else does one make these sort of journeys to? And discovering that there was this box in my parents' basement that I had not seen in, in many years and had actually completely forgotten that it had existed. And it was this big Coleman camping cooler, which I had stored some stuff. I'd moved around a lot in, our 20, in my 20s and 30s, as many of us do, and forgot about some stuff, and things disappeared. And I opened up this box, and lo and behold, in the box was a series of, of stuff that I had not seen since around 1984, which is the year I graduated from high school, back in the dark days of the Reagan administration. Um, and so this was the basic set that we first played with. This is the Dungeon Master's Guide that I played with back in the day. And that's a certain surly teenager, circa uh, 19, approximately 1982, 1983. We're not exactly sure. Uh, and to give you a little bit of a taste uh, of, of kind of what that world was like for me, um, we're going to try to play this movie. Um, I might need to actually get up and hit it, or maybe you can. This is a, <clears throat> before you hit play, maybe, Jonathan, just a brief, I mentioned before, I was, I was also a budding filmmaker. I wanted to be the next Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, so I went off to this, was about to go off onto this uh, college experience where I was going to be a filmmaker, but I had had the Super 8 camera all through middle school and high school, and I was making animated movies and goofy home movies, and literally had forgotten I'd made this movie, and about three years ago, some couple years after my book came out, in some ways, I'd wish I'd discovered this before my book came out. But I found this again in another box of stuff that I had forgotten about. And this is a document from that era. Uh, so you can hit play, Jonathan, if you would, please. We'll see what happens. Um, and this is, a, this is a, uh, an actual uh, session of D&D from the 1980s, from 1981. It shot very poorly by yours truly. It's verite. It's exactly. <laughs> Yeah, all in-camera editing, there's no, uh, you know, this is before iMovie, obviously, we just kind of wing this. And uh, it's quite blurry, and, and it's not in a great, not in great shape, uh, but I, I found this thing and projected it on the wall, and um, it did not have sound. The sound you would hear is just basically the, the projector going, <laughs> that goes with it. But um, the, 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 there we go, there's me in the middle. There it is, there's the sound. And these are some of the guys. A little stop motion fun here. Um, and as you can see, this was just this is just us hanging out. It was somebody's birthday. It might have been my birthday. So this birthday cake that makes a an appearance here. But we're just sitting around the table, and we've got our dice in front of us. There's me rolling some dice, and there's Eric in the background slugging some Mountain Dew or Joel Cole or something. Um, it looked like Bill was smoking there or something. I think he was just holding a dice up to his mouth. Anyways, it's a short clip. Uh, but in my own way, I was trying to capture that world that you know, I spent so much time um, uh, immersing myself in. And as I mentioned, it, it was a kind of time, it was a real time that I think we've in some ways lost in that there were no interruptions. You know, there was a phone, but the phone was an analog phone that had a cord and was attached to the wall. And someone might call or an older sister might wander in the room and all the boys would look over for a second and then go back to the game. That was pretty much all it was in terms of interruptions. 
And, um, uh, and, and this wasn't really a, a franchise or a, something to buy or any kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, movie sequel to sort of, you know, experience on, 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 uh, on, on the internet or something. It was, it was a very, it was a very sort of uh, DIY kind of uh, experience. And, and for me, I found it to be incredibly um, uh, impactful. And of course, at the time, I didn't really understand how much it had changed me and how much, how important it was to my development. It's only in retrospect, as an older guy looking back, that I see some of this stuff. Uh -huh. um, this is my group today. Uh, WBUR did a story about my gaming group uh, last week. A reporter came to my living room, and this is what we, uh, uh, this is what we're doing. And interestingly enough, although he's not pictured in this photo, my uh, the guy who taught me how to play D and D uh, is now my brother-in-law. His name is JP, and he now lives in Boston, so he's the same age as I. So here it is, thirty. Can't do the math. Whatever it is, 32 years later, uh, and we're playing D&D uh, &D again. Wow. Um, so uh, that part of it hasn't changed uh, for us anyway. Do the natures of your disputes around the table change? Well, one of the things arising that I, from the game, they, they don't. I mean, I think what that what I what I think for me anyway, what I find in ways better. It's a better experience for me in some ways. It's less immersive. I, it's a little hard for me to get back into that complete. Um, sort of suspension of disbelief moment that you have, I think, is easier as a teenager. But what I love about playing now is that there's not all this sort of bullshit, you know, young adolescent boy power struggle stuff going on. We really just want to tell a good story and have a good time so that if you know at all how the game is played, the Dungeon Master has quite a bit of power and can set the tone for the game. And, the, and we'll talk about this some more later about sort of is the DM a kind of real stickler for rules, a rules lawyer, or like going to just only do what's, 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 Yes. abide by the rules that are in the book, or are they going to, yeah. is he going to kind of, you know, cut some corners and make it so that the game is fun? Yeah. And I feel like what we're doing now in this, in this situation, we're really just, I feel like we're all telling a story together. We're writing a novel together. And in fact, not unsurprisingly, a lot of us are writers. Uh, so it was a perfect training ground for us as writers. Hmm. Um, maybe I should yeah, sure. go to the next one. This is another photo that was dug up. Yeah, I dug this out of my archives. Here. That was my Dungeons and Dragons Which group. one is Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that immediately. And what's cool about it, as you'll see here, this is the Dungeon Master's Guide. It's a little blurry for you guys. but uh, And I was able to identify the module that the gentleman in the back is holding up, which is a off-the-rack dungeon that you can buy. It's called White Plume Mountain S2, if you guys know the terminology. But I was like, wait a minute, that's so cool. So this is for real. This is, you can't, you can't really fake this in Photoshop. Well, you probably could, but I, I trust that it's genuine. No, those were uh, good times. Good times, yes. What, what about for you? What was your experience like at this time? And how old are you in this photo? Well, I'm probably 12. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm probably 12. And I found that there was certainly a varying degree of commitment to the campaign, to the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. And so you'd have some kids with attention spans that were um, on the low side. Yep. And so uh, trying, I think, to um, titrate out the game in a way that satisfied them and at the same time satisfied the sticklers for yeah. procedure. People were getting different things out of the game. Yeah, yeah. And trying to satisfy all of that maybe is a meta rule, a meta job of the dungeon master, not just to run the game, but to determine the nature of the game. Yeah. But at sometimes it might not be reconcilable. I mean, yeah. this is obviously a moment where we're not actually playing the game. We appear to just and be- And there's a million of you. That's, a, that's a, just, a, yeah. just, a, just a crowd control level. Yeah. It's, it's amazing that you would be able to sit down and there's like nine of you or 10 of you, Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Well, I think that, that points to a really interesting divide in the game, which is this Feel free of, to move to the next slide. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, immediately the next slide is blank. Yeah. Um, the, the, the sort of dichotomy or divide in the game between those like me who are mostly interested in the, I can never remember if it's right brain or left brain, but the sort of creative, sort of more ephemeral kind of um, storytelling sides of it versus yes. the other, is it left brain or right brain? I can't remember. The other brain of people who are more interested in, the, in the, the rules and the numbers and the statistics and the logic side. And for me, I was, I was never as much of a stickler for you know, let's look at this chart and let's make sure that absolutely the roll was made and let's spend 20 minutes arguing over this rule. And what page in the Dungeon Master's Guide was it? Oh, it was, it's on page 79. And no, 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 it's this, Gary Gygax himself can contradicts himself on page 123. I mean, whatever. The, these Until rules. William Shatner comes out and tells us all to get a life. That's right. Exactly. 
And, and that was the kind of uh, the pull. There were some kids in our group who were quite dreamy like me and loved the art and the, the making of the maps and imagining the backstories and the worlds. And, and there were those who just wanted to go in and kill shit. They just wanted to get into the dungeon and start killing as much and leveling up as much as they could and becoming as powerful. And um, we had one player in our, our group. We had three guys named Bill, actually. Bill S, Bill K, um, and Bill T. And, and Bill S was a new player. And he's like, OK, when do, when do we? You know, when do I get to fight you know, Odin or something like that? I mean, he immediately was like, he wanted to play and he wanted to become a god and become like all powerful. And that's very attractive. What's he doing today? I don't entirely know. I know he, I know he lives uh, in, uh, in the area. Uh, but one of the, one of the <laughs> that's somewhat menacing. <laughs> well, I'm realizing this is this is broadcast uh, across the internet. To be careful what I say. Bill, well, if Bill's you're out there, is right. Bill, don't hurt him. One of the one of the things that's interesting is to think about where you know where some of the guys who I did play D and D where they are today. Yes. And and sort of how pe how many people did pursue traditionally geeky sort of careers like IT or, or, or computer science, how many people went into the arts or went into yes. music or writing or something like that. But so that gets in some ways to the question of. You're ready to make the claim, not just we all kind of do fun stuff as kids, and then we end up growing up and we look back fondly on it, but that there's something distinctive about these, this form of gaming and play mm -hmm. that actually shapes life later in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. And can you put your finger on what that is? I think it, I think it has a lot to do with the, the, I spoke earlier about the tension between the right and left brain types and also the sort of rules interpretation side. But I think, I think what's also part of the, what's wonderful about the game is that it's much like um, if you read Lord of the Rings or some of the fantasy writers who have developed these very elaborate worlds is that they have, they've created the groundwork, they've gone deep into many areas, but they've left a lot of areas unexplored or undefined. And so as a reader of Lord of the Rings, you're wondering, okay, here's where the fellowship is going, but just off the path a couple hundred leagues, there's some other cool thing going on that Tolkien never got around to writing about. And D&D is sort of that same way. There's all these rules, and there's all the stuff that can, you can get up and, 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 and go and play immediately. You can buy something off the shelf and start playing. But it, it encourages you to, to imagine what if, what next. You know, what is sort of the next phase of, of, of this uh, scenario that could happen? What, what are the sort of outcomes or possibilities? And in that way, it's a perfect, you know, all kinds of simulation games are great for this anyway. And many of you, I'm sure, played simulation games in school. But the idea of teaching us how to, how to think creatively about how to solve a problem, how to imagine alternative outcomes. And I think I would argue alternative points of view. And I think the, the experience of role playing, both other races and other genders and other people who are not like you, um, you know, no one wants to play a wimpy teenage boy in one of these worlds because he'll get slaughtered in, you know, in the first 20 minutes of the game. So you play someone who's not like you. And that's an empowering experience for, for a kid, for sure, and, and, to, and to a certain extent an adult. But also that process of doing that creates a kind of uh, training ground maybe for empathy or for understanding other people. So, um, so that's certainly part of it. Um, and I think also the, the, re, the, the the, the demands it places on the imagination, because it isn't a game like a, not that I'm against video games, I've played a ton of video games in my day and, and would spend more time playing video games if I could afford to do so. Um, but the, the idea of, is the, is the, the experience you're participating in uh, something you pre-visualized for you, or is it something that requires you and the, and the artwork or the story you're creating to meet it halfway in, in the imagination, much like reading a book, uh, I like to think is, is on some level a better or, yes. I would say better, but a, a, in some ways a more a more a more uh, involving experience yes. than watching a movie or something like that. Um, people will probably disagree, and you feel free to disagree later. We can. Well, talk about in that. fact, I'm curious even right now if there's anybody who wants to put something on the table who has played or does play that either complements or um, is in counterpoint to the game as it's been described so far. Is anybody wanting to? Say anything about. We can also we can also roll experience. this. <laughs> case there any disputes? To see, yeah. we'll, just, we'll just see what happens, and then we'll fight it out. You know, somehow that's how it works, right? So, yes. So. That's a twenty-sided. This bounce. is a twenty-sided. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It bounces too, which is kind of nice. It's handy. Wow, wonderful. Non-lethal. I'm so interested. Is there anybody who wants to say anything, or people are feeling shy all of a sudden? We can. We can. Yes, sir. And uh, tell us um, uh, when you played 
and who your character was. Uh, so I played uh, primarily in high school and early college, and then every now and again I have a, a relapse of sorts, uh, <laughs> particularly at like PAX East or something like that. I'll jump into a game. PAX East, the big it's, convention that's in Boston, is it not? That is correct. Yeah. Um, so, and I would typically play the ranger because I always like the idea of two swords. But and a ranger is one of those kind of specialty characters. That's that's. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like fighter variant. Yeah, think of think of Strider slash Aragorn. That's sort of the yeah. quintessential. So, <clears throat> so more rules um, and kind of more in depth, but a lot of interesting ideas. But I think what was always fascinating to me and kind of what really made me grow create creatively based off of this that I still kind of use today, just in the practice of law, is that D and D kind of forces you to take all sorts of different people's ideas and all sorts of different things as true. And then you have to weave all those together into some sort of a narrative that makes sense and comes alive and jumps off the page. And by to, other people's ideas, do you mean different legendaria, different, or you mean more like what they want to have happen in the game? I think a little bit of both, um, but primarily the second one, where one of your friends says, "Well, I want to do X. Um, I want I want to go. I want to sneak behind the monsters and surprise them." And then you have to kind of roll with that, and you have to incorporate so that into your own story. So on a very tactical story. level, as the group is making a decision. Well, not even just that. It's just it, what their character ideas are, what their philosophies mm. are, like all this stuff. You have to weave it all together into one narrative. And the narrative's not just something that one person spits out and has total control over. You have to be kind of very creative and very almost like a... Um, uh, like Im improvisational. Mm. Uh -huh. and defining the story as you go along. And did your dungeon master run a tight ship? Uh, typically not. Uh, uh -huh. we, we didn't get too much playing done at times. But, and I did mean, you was, ever get a mulligan if something got rolled and everybody's like, well, that was too bad. Let's just roll that again? Yeah, there's a lot of times where it was like, well, but here's, here's actually the interesting part, is that that's kind of the easy way out. Because sometimes what we found as time went on is taking the mulligan, that doesn't make for a very good story because it just came out how everyone wanted it to. What was more fun is to deal with the failure and say, all right, well, my character has just fallen down this crevasse, for example. Um, and now, like, I'm hanging on by, like, by the roots of my fingers. What is, what is everyone else going to do to save me? And then that makes them be creative. And then somebody screws up on that, and then there's another layer of creativity. Um, so kind of rather than just having the story always come out that you want, you kind of see the beauty in having to deal with the story not always coming out as you want, but still telling a, a fascinating and mm -hmm. fun story. Uh -huh. As long as it's not a total party kill. Yeah. Like nobody yeah. dies. And that's part of it too. I think that, I think that we, we um, as storytellers, we want, you know, we, want, we want good outcomes. And D&D is a great game because it does offer that chance. Like you roll a 20 and anything's possible, even if you're the... You know, to use a Lord of the Rings equivalent, like even if you're the lowliest, you know, sort of most insignificant hobbit, you still have a chance to go do this incredible feat and cast the. I love how you fired just, once the you know into the fires once it came. You couldn't build a die with more sides than twenty and really have it work, or can you? There is like a fifty-sided or hundred-sided die. There's a, multiples of something that work. Yeah, but uh -huh. you bit, yeah. But I just like have one out of twenty is like so impossible. That's right, exactly. <laughs> Well, that was what, what was a really interesting innovation with the game is that, you know, obviously most games have the six-sided die, and those are your options, which you kind of run out of possibilities, mathematical possibilities. And I believe that Gagax or Arneson, one of the two founders, you know, found some, you know, polyhedral geometry supply store or something like that and came up with, oh, you know, we can use this instead of just pulling little pieces of paper out of a Dixie cup, which was another way to randomize things. Uh -huh. But that, that sort of tension between there are strict rules, but there's always a chance, you know. Right. The, there's, there's chaos and anything can happen. It's a huge fantasy world where theoretically anything can happen. It's magic. You can do anything. But no, you can't because if you can do anything, then everyone's going to be 100th level and have 18s and everything, and it's just no fun, right? So there has to be that chance where you're going to fail. Uh -huh. uh, but you get to get up again. And if your DM is kind, you, you get a resurrection or you come back and, 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 and you learn from your mistakes. Uh, which is a lesson, uh, maybe one of the lessons here. Lesson, I forget, I came up with 15 lessons, but you know, if I did this list again, I'd probably come up with nine or And we're going to roll 16. to see which lesson Exactly. I know I should lesson. have done 20. I don't know why I didn't think of that. Um, but the idea that you, know, you, you, do, you do sort of learn this idea that you, 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 you know, it gets better, you know, that you do start at level one, uh, but it does get better. Tell you us survive. about say what you mean, do what you say. Well, one of the things in D&D &D that is, uh, and, and there's probably a courtroom equivalent to this, but you know, you're in the dungeon and you're you know, deep down below and, and, and one of the players says, okay, I take out my, uh, 
uh, you know, my, my mirror, and I reflect you know, back the gaze of the Gorgon or something like that. And the DM says, well, is, is a mirror written down on your character sheet? Did you say you brought a mirror with you? And there's an argument, no, no, I, I always bring a mirror. Did you say, you know, or, or like what order did you, you know, did you go into the room or did you just say you're about to go into the room? Oh, you can't talk to him because he's 30 feet away. You know, all the things that we imagine is happening versus what you're really saying, right? And at the same time, you know, backing that up with action, I think is an interesting idea. So you're not just, uh, what happens in oftentimes in a game is there's a, a kind of in-character talk and then there's a meta talk, sort of, there's the rules talk, what, what are you doing? And then there's a moment, all right, get into character, what's actually happening in this moment? What's, what's realistic that could really happen with six or 10 people or seven people in your party in this environment? What is that physically gonna feel yes. like? Uh, and I think players are quite adept, good players I think are adept at yes. jumping in and out of those pretty yes. effortlessly. Why don't we leave the rules, uh, the lessons sure. up here, and I'm just curious if there are others who wanna share a thought. Uh, Bruce, why don't you go ahead and then we'll pass it back. No, oh, you, you want. I think you want to know when we started. I, I started playing D and D in 1976 when I was 13. And well, how were you introduced to it? Uh, we discovered it. I mean, it, this is back before those books came out. And when the, bef the books before those, the rules fundamentally made no sense. So everyone who played had to invent their own rules. The first thing you did as as a DM was invent your systems and then play them. The standardized systems came and years what was later. Your character. Uh, back then, I don't remember. The character I play now, I, start, I started playing in 1981, and I'm still playing, is a 16th level MU. Magic user. Magic user. And, and we play twice a year. We, we started playing in college, and we still play twice a year. Is it a point of pride, by the way, that they're called magic users rather than wizards, magicians, so, or like magic, <laughs> like they, 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 fighters they, they, and a sword user? So that, that's, what, that's what they were called in the books. Yeah. Uh, the reason was the levels all had names, and wizard was a particular level. I forget which one. So they use the generic, and Again, that's just Venn diagrams. It, it, Magic <laughs> user is the circle. No, no, the, the, no, just it was different, different levels. Yeah, anyway, that was the name. That's what we use. Like using DM instead of GM. It depends on when you hit the game, which which game master, not General Motors. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but DM was the original <laughs> name, and those of us who started playing wing, so. in the 70s still yeah. use that. Yeah. Uh, so, so the, the the thing was different in the early days was inventing your own rules because the rules didn't make sense. I mean, you got the three books, you got Greyhawk but you still had to make sense of the rules because they didn't actually work. Sounds a lot like Lesson 11 here. Right. But, it, but it's, it's different. It's not make up a new rule. It's, it's make up the new rules. Before you start playing, you don't use those books. You write your own. And there are several of those that came out at that time. David Hargrave did one. Uh, Cerulean Sorcery was one of those. Smiles and Trolls. Right. All of those. Uh, I guess the point I want to make is I think one of the things, the benefits of doing this as a kid is what D&D &D gives you which you don't have is agency. That by role playing in someone else's story, you can affect the world in a way you can't. You learn how, you practice being an adult, being someone with agency, because in the story you have it. And that's incredibly empowering for a geeky kid, for someone who you know, just is just going to school and doing nothing. And you think if you maybe don't do it, you might be less inclined to realize your own agency later? It's, it's, it's practicing agency. I, mean, I think you'll realize it later, but practicing it gives you a leg up. You have, uh -huh. it, it's, it's interacting with others, other adults as an adult, adult situations as an adult, uh, dealing with a rule set. I mean, rules lawyering is, is something you, know, you learn how to do. Hmm. You know, even if you're, you're in the, I, mean, I think you had two, a left brain, right brain gaming. I always thought of it as three. They're, they're the tacticians, they're the storytellers and they're the role players. There's mm. three types of, of, of DMs. That's a good way of looking at it, yeah. And, like and, that's, yeah. and, you know, and which they, are you, Bruce? Hmm? Which are you? The game we play now is fundamentally a tactical game with, with also with storytelling elements. I mean, uh -huh. Games will all have all three, but I think one is always the forefront. Uh -huh. you know, we'll do battles that last, no joke, 12 hours of real time, mm. which, is, which is idiotic. <laughs> At every possible level, but we've been doing this for 30 years, and we can't stop. And are you doing it without distractions then? It's like it, phone it, is in privacy mode? Or? No, right now, you know, there's the internet, there are always distractions. Uh -huh. But actually, when a game lasts 12 hours, when a battle lasts 12 hours, you cannot pay attention for that long. Fundamentally, it's impossible. Uh -huh. But it's, it's, it's something we do and have done, it, and it, it holds a, a group of friends of mine together. And it's the, a thing that's made us cohesive. Is the role of the decades. dice sacrosanct for you? Yeah, our, our GM fudges. He doesn't talk about it. But we know he fudges. Uh huh. So there's a meta role that says it's okay to fudge. It's not okay, but he does it. 
<laughs> We've and been he, doing this for decades. We're sort of. And know is he each doing others. it for the sake of the narrative? Eh, I think he does it for the sake of us surviving. He always under he always underestimates the power of his of his monsters. Uh huh. Even after thirty years. Uh huh. <laughs> One more comment back here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so, uh, a lot of this sounds staggeringly familiar, and this is beginning to sound a little like. A, and you're uh, a former player, not a current yeah. one. I'm not. I'm played in a very long time. And you're. But I always feel like a current player. And your character was. Uh, well, I had several characters. Uh, one I, I remember. You know, the, the names are are from a different different time a little bit. Uh, Featherstone, I think, was the guy's name. Nice. Uh, which was vaguely embarrassing, but. Uh, and what type of character? Um. He was a combination of a magic user and something else. All my characters were combinations of things. Um, but it's that's extremely revealing in some way, isn't yes, it? It's it like, is. Ah, yes. <laughs> it things. turns out to be, you know, actually quite, quite descriptive. Um, I think I was, I was thinking about we were actually quite explicit when we were kids. After a certain point, and, and vaguely uh, had different levels of discomfort with the extent to which this felt like an LSAT training course at, mm -hmm. at, at times. Uh, and, I, and I think if I were to describe sort of in, in retrospect what I felt like the kind of benefits were to this as, as an activity, um, there was this idea of competitive interpretation. You know, we all, we all knew the rules and, and a good portion of the game was uh, invested in who could make a, a more persuasive case that their version of the rules, the one that they wanted to be, was the one that should carry the day and, and apply. And that, that, was, that was always a thing that, that came up, and there was a lot of creativity around and it that. And uh, um, it was, uh, it was it persuading the dungeon master or all by consensus? Nominally, it was persuading the dungeon master, but, but practically speaking, there had to be a general sense that there was consensus that, that it was fair. Uh -huh. uh, we didn't have dictatorial uh, dungeon masters in it. In fact, the, the general vibe was that when we were playing, we were all trying to help each other succeed, and that included the dungeon master. The dungeon master was not typically out to get the other guys, but to create circumstances where they could succeed. And we would rotate who the dungeon master was, and we would have campaigns that would last a year at a time, mm. um, and that, that would carry on. And, um, and with the same group of people, roughly? Yeah, very small group. And was there ever an expulsion from the group? There was never an expulsion from the group. What happened in the form of expulsion was, was related to what you talked about. There in our school, where it was a group of people who played, but we very quickly separated into two separate groups based on the people who were like serious about the rules and the people who um, were not. I mean, we were serious about the rules, but, uh, but I guess the, but, but we used the rules to allow us to do anything, and they used the rules to constrain themselves. I can tell which side you were on in yeah. that battle. Yeah. <laughs> by, by that description, no yeah. doubt. But, um, but uh, it, uh, for us, it was kind of a, a rules-based storytelling. And, uh, and again, the, the, the rules were, and I think this is part of why it's constructive, we came to see a set of rules as a tool and not as, as a trap or, or constraint. It was a tool that you could use to tell a story and do fabulous things. And, uh, and this is, I think, why it relates to people being good computer programmers or, or being good lawyers, is, mm. is the, the rule systems are, are just the raw materials for mm -hmm. your imagination and, and not authority figures or, yes. or, or any And open to things. interpretation. I mean, what little I know about the law and how it works is part of your job in the, if you're arguing a case is you are making the case that your version of, not just your version of the events and the story you're going to tell about what happened That's right. is, going, is going to be persuasive, but also there's, there's arguments about what, yes. I guess what, you know, that's not quite what, particularly when you think about the Constitution, you know, what, what is, what is, yes. is that really what they intended or yes. can, we, can we bend the rule understanding that, you know, it's more applicable if you think of it in this way or... And I guess that's sort of the originalists, they'd go back, well, Gary Gygax intended... Yes, X, right. Or textual... Exactly, style. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and there would be all kinds of uh, uh, offshoots and splinter groups, both in rule sets as D&D &D developed yes. and other role-playing games developed over the 70s and 80s and 90s and yes. 2000s about, you know, I only play version 2.0 or I only play 3.5 or 4.0 was, you know, was an abomination or, you know, whatever it is, people are quite... Yes. Quite uh, incompatible constitution. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. People are quite. People are quite. Uh, one one last thing that yeah, came last up in, in that connection that I thought was 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 interesting was um, the the role of magic in the system. So uh, uh, 
someone I became acquainted with later when working on, on computer-based games, was uh, he hated the system of Dungeons and Dragons because in his view, uh, all the things about magic were exceptions to the rule system. And um, whereas other games, magic was more integrated into the rule system. And, hmm. and I thought that that was actually great. And um, because that's what magic is. It's uh, you know, an over, overriding of the rules. And when I think back about the distinction between the two groups, um, it really was about the extent to which one was comfortable or not comfortable with extent exceptions to the rule and the place that they played in, in, hmm. in one's uh -huh. experience. I want Ethan to be able to do a little bit of a reading for us from the book. Uh, before he does, just on the way back, there's also uh, character alignment. That's right, Somehow yeah. Somehow announce or choose uh, your character's general orientation to things along two uh, normal axes. One is good and evil, and the other is chaos and order. Um, yeah. Just what did you generally play? What were your... I don't remember the chaos and order, but I don't remember the end of the Uh-huh. Same thing? Good? Neutral good. Neutral good. So, in other words, indecisive between chaos and order. Yeah, pretty much. But just good. Just good. Bruce? Yeah, neutral. neutral. Plain out neutral. Again, it has to do with when you, what rule set you're playing. Yes. I'm not playing D&D. &D, yes, set. yes. Uh, the original ones just had Law and Chaos, which really came from, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Michael Morcock. And, hmm. uh, and then Good and Evil were added afterwards. Uh, uh -huh. So in the game, everyone has to be sort of on the okay side. No one plays chaotic, no one plays evil. So you're either a lawful good yes. or, or, or neutral is really what Yes. For which I guess there are. Maybe we should just show it real quick before you do the reading. Sure. There's the. Uh, maybe we're I forget what for number it. it is. Oh, oh I can find it. Uh, we have. Well, that's the blue cooler I was telling you about. There it is. I do have it. That's the stuff that I found in it. Among. Do you want to keep looking uh, for it? Do you want to just scroll through to find it, or yeah, you want to try to find? You're it? talking about the uh, the meme at the end there. The yeah. The Perry Mason, not the Perry Mason thing, but the Twelve Angry Men. Where is it? Yes. Um, sorry, we'll come back to some of these if you want to. We, we thought we could, there. So this is something I found on the internet. That was amusing. Yeah, so this uh, is the alignment th chart. There's only nine in, you know, in nine jury. alignments or 12 angry men, if you recall, in the jury. But um, it's been a while since I've seen the movie. But it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting idea that, that, that you would never want a party that was too, uh, people's belief systems were too, uh, d you know, divergent or just there would just be no way to g agree on anything. Yes. The, the idea is that the game is cooperative and you're all working for, towards some common good and it, it really comes out of this you know, somewhat romantic idea that I think Tolkien came, out, yes. came up with and other fantasy writers where we all work together for this common cause. But, but a lot of parties would inter introduce you know, inter-party conflict, which was always, that's when things started to break down. Yes. You know, but like, I guess it turns out this framework, I guess you can apply to almost any group or narrative. Like in Harry Potter, Dumbledore is clearly chaotic good. No, he's like subversive, but good. And then uh, you can go on right on down the line uh, with folks. I so I find, uh, my, uh, find my glasses here. Oh what yes, okay. We're going to hear the. Uh... So I thought I'd just do a quick reading. I, one of the things I thought, of just in relation to this group here, how many people here are law students here? So a fair number of you. Okay, good. Um, you know, trying to skew this towards there, skew this towards maybe your audience, but. Uh, one of the things that I thought about in, in particular in response to a couple of your comments was, what was it for us, when I remember back to those times, what was it for us that was the appeal of, of this game? And part of it was, I think, the agency you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. Bruce, right? But also the idea that we had mastery over a subject matter, which I think is so important to law and to a lot of people who want to specialize um, in their careers or any kind of area of study. This idea that you, as partic particularly as teenagers, we had secret knowledge. Right, that our parents didn't know what we were doing, and that was very powerful. Uh, so this is just a short, a short page or two from the book. This is in the, in the second or third chapter. I, I, I talk a lot about, uh, this is after I've, um, I've actually found the, the blue cooler, um, and, but I haven't opened up the blue cooler yet. So I find it in my parents' basement. I bring it home. It's sitting in my office. I'm thinking a lot about what's happened to, me, to my life at this point, and I'm having a sort of Retro, you know, sort of reflective moment, thinking back to my high school years, and really trying to think about what, what was it about the game that was really um, important. The other thing I should just really quickly add is that the I think I reference it in this section. One of the things that, coincidental, I don't know if this is just fate looking out for me or something, but 
the same year that I discovered this game, Dungeons and Dragons, was the same year that uh, my mother had come home from the hospital. She suffered a, a, um, a traumatic brain aneurysm. Curiously enough, as a graduate student at Harvard, uh, she'd come down to Cambridge for the year to get a master's degree in teaching. She was 38 years old, and uh, she was uh, renting an apartment over in Huron Village, and uh, had been suffering from headaches all summer long, and we were living with my dad and my stepmom at the time. My parents were divorced. And uh, they found her, uh, the brain aneurysm had ruptured. She was rushed to the hospital. She spent four, four to five months in, at Mass General, actually. And then that late winter, early spring, she came home. So the summer that I met this kid, JP, who taught me how to play D&D, was the same summer that me, my brother, and sister, and I, and a family friend were living with my mom and kind of getting to know the new mother. So anyway, um, I think I mentioned that a little bit, so I thought I would, I thought I would, uh, would, would give you that backstory because otherwise it won't make much sense. The joy in the game was not simply the anything-can-happen fantasy setting and the killing and pseudo-heroism, but also the rules. Hundreds of rules existed for every situation. Geeks and nerds love rules. A, sorry, D&D &D and its sequel, AD&D, &D, or Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, let us traffic in specialized knowledge found only in hardbound books with names like Monster Manual and Dungeon Master's Guide. As we played, we consulted charts, indices, tables, descriptions of attributes, lists of spells, causes and effects, like a school unto itself, filled with answers to questions about the rarity of magic items, crossing terrain, and how to survive poison. We loved to fight over the minutiae. And I have a little footnote here that says, sample argument, player, what do you mean a gelatinous cube gets a plus on surprise? Dungeon master, it's invisible, player, but it's a 10-foot cube of jello. Let me see that. Player grabs monster manual from DM. 20 minute argument ensues. We could tell a mace from a morning star, a cudgel from a club, and we knew how to draw them. We knew a creature called a white inflicted one to four hit points of damage when it attacked. Could we recharge wands? No. If I died, I could be resurrected because, according to page 50 of the player's handbook, a ninth level cleric could raise a person who had been dead for no longer than nine days. Note, that the body of the person must be whole, otherwise missing parts will still be missing when the person is brought back to life. That's a quote from the player's handbook. All good stuff to know. Trolls and fireballs may be fanciful, but they have to behave according to a logical system. Like in life, fantasy rules were affected by chance, the roll of the dice. And as if they were jewels, we collected bags of them, plastic polyhedral dice, sorry, polyhedral game dice, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and 20-sided baubles that like I Ching sticks or coins foretold our fortunes when cast. A spinning die such as the icosahedral D20 could land in a 20, a hit. You slice the lizard man's head off and green blood spurts everywhere. As often as one, miss, your sword swings wide and you stab yourself. Loser. The world my mother's illness left in its wake was unpredictable and emotionally unsafe. My parents had divorced six years before the aneurysm, and my father and stepmother, six hours away in Canada, couldn't offer much by way of daily guidance or supervision. My mother couldn't cook dinner or drive a car, so how could she possibly raise three teenagers? A good friend of my mother's named Alice agreed to move in with my family when my mom returned from the hospital. Over the years, a steady stream of my mother's other relatives, sorry, my mother's other friends and Alice's relatives coming and going would pitch in to help. The role of parent was played by a cast of characters. But above all, Alice carried the weight. She ended up staying and caring for us and my mother until my siblings and I left for college. The lesson, real life thus far had taught me that in the adult world, fate was chaotic and uncertain. Guidelines for success were arbitrary, but in the world of D&D, &D, at least, there was a rule book. We knew what we needed to roll to succeed or survive. The finer points of its rules and the possibility of predicting outcomes offered comfort make-believe as they were, skirmishes and public, sorry, puzzle solving endemic to D&D &D had immediate and palpable consequences. By role playing, we were in control and our characters, be they thieves, magic users, paladins or druids, wandered through places of danger, their destinies ostensibly within our grasp. At the same time, we understood that our characters' failures and triumphs were decided by unknown forces, malevolent or kindly. Such was the double-edged quality of our fantasy life where random cruelty or unexpected fortune ruled the day. The game was a risk-free milieu for doing adult things. It was also a relief to live life in another skin and act out behind the safety of pumped up attributes. D&D &D characters had statistics in, in six key areas, strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, and charisma. These ranged 
from 3 to 18. Ethan, the real boy's stats would have been all under 10. The fighter character, my fighter character Elrons were all 16s, 17s, and 18s. Anyway, there's more in that vein, which I, I'll stop it right there. But um, for for the uh, for the adult player, I find the 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 appeal is much less to do with the kind of vicarious. Um, yeah, there's a lot of escapism. Escapism, and and although I think it still offers a, a, an important escape for me, uh, but it it's a little less. Uh, uh, I mean, the last thing I want to suggest is that somehow D and D is, you know exist to compensate for one's lacks in the real world. I mean, I think that that's really unfair. Um, but in my particular case, there were some specific circumstances in my life that were, were, were needing of distraction from, and I think that the game provided that uh, and gave me, gave me a place to park, park myself for a few years and, and gather strength. And I think, as, as I think Bruce said and others, this idea of practicing outcomes, imagining futures, maybe it may be a little bit wary, you know, but, but that's, that's good training, you know. The opening quote and part of what you talked about on the rules, it's come up several times, just the minutiae that can be very fun LSAT mm -hmm. style to master, that's, that's complicating, but there's also a piece, and maybe the escapism uh, such as it was is part of it, that's simplifying, that you take the complex world and it can be reduced to right. mere rolls of the dice. Yeah, yeah, right. Consensus. So there's a neat kind of contrast between complicating and simplifying, and in particular, back to the alignment question, I know you've asked the question before, um, is it okay to kill everything that's evil? Right. That there is sort of these elements of you know what's a monster and what's not. It's pretty rare that there's a indifferent non-player character mm -hmm. or other mm -hmm. character. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how that either got worked out in the game or if we translate it to the law, do we look for the cause that we can tell ourselves is appropriate and then be able to lose ourselves as lawyers and advocates yeah. in that cause? To, to, to prove someone's innocence. Yeah, or I mean, I, how often is. have you heard from the likes of Dershowitz, uh, who I think has gone on record saying he would absolutely defend Hitler, for example, because everybody deserves a lawyer. And it's the job of the system, adversarial or otherwise, to sort out who's right and who's wrong. But the only way it works is if you can lose yourself in your occupation and not have to worry about the complete right, system. Yeah. I wonder if that's an example then of being able to say, at least from my point of view, the other side is the enemy yeah. and I get to go after them. Well, I think when, when there's a, in my experience, the better games were the ones where the, I think the players did feel invested emotionally in what they were trying to accomplish. And there was a, there was a quest, which is the classic idea, you know, you must go to the Obsidian Hills and, you know, rescue the shard of... I was going to say Narsal, but that's been done before. You know, the shard of hulaha, because, you know, whatever. And so at all costs, you do this, and it must be done. And so anything gets in your way is, is, is basically, you know, uh, potentially going to be run that through That sounds like a sword. difficult, like not the best life lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and what's, what's curious about it is I think the more sophisticated player, or I think as over time, you realize if the, if the, the dungeon master is a good one, they, he or she will create scenarios where, yes, the best solution is to kill. Like, that is the only way through the problem. But in many cases, it was a puzzle you had to solve, or it was, it was, you had to parley with your foe. You had to sort of negotiate. There wasn't always, the answer was not always just to kill something wantonly. I don't think as a teenager player, I was too concerned about whether it was good or evil, or hmm. the vicarious violence. There's, of course, a lot of thinking about violent video games. It does, does the act of killing something virtually make you inherently more violent or mess you up in some profound way, and, and of course D&D at the time, for those of you who remember the game in the day and remember the news stories, was the video, violent video games of its era. I mean, in the 1980s, there were numerous scares uh, about its either ability to seduce you know, unsuspecting you know, children to malevolent forces of Satan, or else you know, was going to cause people to do harmful things, you know, commit suicide and so forth. And a lot of these were one or two cases that were very well publicized, and next thing you know, there's a 60 Minutes you know, report on it. Uh, and Gary Gygax is defending, you know, the game uh, on national television, uh, which, by the way, sold a bunch of copies of the game. Uh, you, know, you know, that was the most brilliant thing that could have ever happened to D and D. Banned in Boston. Ban exactly. So the 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 that argument is I, I never really bought that one, but but it's understandable that the moral universe that this exists in is something that people want to know about. This is something that comes up in video games as well. Are you just running through and playing Grand Theft Auto, Auto or whatever, just killing wantonly, or are there any moments where you do have to sort of make the game, the game developers have created a scenario where the, the right way to solve the problem is to do the good thing. 
yeah. as opposed to do the worst possible thing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and uh, so much of it depends on, well, the, the, DM, the DM who is either the rule, either the, the judge or the jury, depending on how you want to um, characterize him or her. Question, comment? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of Get the mic just so the webcast can hear it. Is that Paul? Yeah. And uh, if you had a character or have, tell us who it is. Sorry, it's, uh, I'm, I was in the risk demographic, not in the D&D. Um, so I think there's a lot of interest in sort of gamification of learning and gamification of work. I saw a TED talk the other day that basically was if, if all work were like World of Warcraft, all work would be like World of Warcraft, which I thought was a little hmm. reductionist. But what do you see as the best examples of applying gamification approaches to, let's say, more moderately traditional workplaces? I, mean, I get how you can do it if you're Google or Facebook, but how... You know, and I get how it's not going to particularly mm. work at Scadden, but sort of pick a midpoint between those. What, what do you see as best practices? What's been written? What's interesting? What What are we doing in the library about gamifying work? And do you have an example in mind of a, uh, if not successful, notable gamification within the workplace? No, I'm I'm searching for. I mean, it's. Yeah. I mean, work is just an extension. To me, it's just an extension of games. People who like their jobs have more of those elements, but it as a intellectual theme, it's, you know, we, I mean, the bat, Battle of Waterloo was one in the playing fields of Eton. These are not new ideas, right? But, yeah. but as a theme, it's a relatively recent theme. I think a very interesting and powerful one, and certainly the, you know, the bumper sticker that says more people, you know, learn how to do World of Warcraft than, you know, learn physics is, so it tells you there's something powerful there. I'm, I'm just curious what, uh -huh. what do yeah. you see as the elements that, that seem to be working? Well, I'm not a huge sort of modern video gamer, so my my uh, although I I can sort of riff on that a little bit. I feel like the certainly the reward system is really important. I think that what a lot of if you want to think about this very stereotypically, a lot of what might motivate a worker or traditionally has motivated a worker is the promise of promotion, the promise of cool stuff, benefits, raises. Um, but those are few and far between, and of course now we know that there's, you know, <laughs> wages have stagnated. You know, there's not all kinds of reasons why that isn't happening. But but those little bit, of, those little reward systems that could be built in, uh, I, I think I think uh, is something that are um, a game like World of Warcraft does quite uh, uh, effectively, and it encourages you to go higher because it is kind of crappy to start out at, at first level. You just literally are running around killing rats, and you know to build up the experience, the whole idea of experience points, which is a kind of a um, uh, a D&D &D concept that later was used in, in a lot of these concepts of attributes for your character or sort of something to measure how far along you've gone, yeah. how much experience you have or how much buy-in you have into the, yeah. your experiences gets, you know, turned into a number is, is a real idea from D&D. &D. Uh, so throwing that, turning that a little bit on said, the other way I would think about it is the idea of collaboration. You know, I think collaboration is a huge um, lesson from this game uh, from Dungeons and Dragons and other role-playing games that everybody, you can't do it alone and that you require the, the sort of diverse attributes of everybody at the table or in your team or whatever it is. So not just humans can do it, we need people of all races and, and genders and, and not just human fighters but there has to be magic users and thieves and so forth. So it, it, yeah. it encourages a kind of diverse, you know, making, making you feel open to diversity and wanting to be more inclusive in the way you solve a problem because you can't just go into the dungeon on your own. So how that gets translated into the corporate world, I don't entirely know, but I feel like that's a, you know, well, it a lot may of talk show, about teamwork, but it's... It, it may like show it. just how lossy the bumper sticker is of it's time to gamify the workplace because there's a huge range of games and styles. And I think the most obvious way one would do gamification would be to have it first be algorithmic so you just kind of level up according to rules and that's the system. You learn, I think, a very different lesson than the collaboration, Ethan, you're talking about when it's just, I mean, when I think of the most, uh, one of the most salient popular culture references to gamification, it's Glen Gary, Glen Ross, right? There's all the real estate salespeople and first prize is uh, a Cadillac, second prize is steak knives, third prize is you're fired. And all right, everybody, start start following your leads. Yeah. That's gamification, all right. Yeah. Um, but it has a kind of algorithmic quality of just like, how much real estate did you sell today? 
where it sounds, I, I'm reminded, we just pulled this quote um, from Gary Gygax. Oops, why did that, that's extremely puzzling to me. Let me see if I can get it going again. Sorry. Boom. And in that scenario, there has to be a loser in order for it to work, yeah, right? One, Here's what he said about the game. He said, okay. the ultimate aim of the game is to gain sufficient esteem as a good player to retire your character. He becomes a kind of mythical historical figure. So much. Now, in some ways, right, the purpose of work is to retire rich, I guess. <laughs> That's a very means-based view of doing work. But this certainly is different from the standard gamification tropes of to make sure that you've I don't know that you're explicitly leveled up and. But I in think you're, you're. I don't want to monopolize the microphone, but I think your point about the algorithmic is is a profound one and something that we've been trying to do because if you have subjective assessment, the subjectivity always defaults to some hierarchy. Whereas if if the points of whatever kind acquisition is is formal, is a then. Yeah, and in fact, what we heard from Ethan was both about collaboration within the context of a campaign, teamwork when somebody's hanging off the edge of the cliff, but then meta collaboration about the game. We've heard from almost everybody about how you're figuring out the rule sets, what the style of the game, how's, that it is a collective hallucination in which we are engaged. Now, I think that's not a bad description of work. But <laughs> it doesn't always feel that way when you're like, let's get everybody together and we'll just agree to change, you know, the steak knives. Uh, that's a very di so to import into the workplace just the idea of we're going to keep score and there will be winners and losers seems quite different from this conception of the game. There's another comment or thought right so, here. So related, when I think about this, I like to flip it around and think about the way we organize work and how that would ruin D and D. So like, yeah. <laughs> if you show up and I maybe let you pick your race, but I assign you the rest of it, I yeah. set a like, really specific set of rules, and certainly those rules you aren't going to be allowed to violate in any way. I mean, think of all the ways in which we organize work and how it would completely ruin the whole exercise, hmm. and then slowly pair those back to try to see where we can adjust the way we organize work. To but that is to work. say, I mean, it sounds like among Ethan's lessons are, wouldn't it be interesting if people within a workplace realized that they could actually, if they got into a configuration where they could brainstorm a la the way mm -hmm. people have been discussing a campaign goes, maybe more productive work would happen. I guess it depends on what the workplace is about. If it's about churning out widgets, I don't know that, it still might actually. Yes. Yes. We should get the mic over just yeah. in case the uh, people. Yeah, the boss is dungeon over. master. That's a good one. Who, who, whom you're ostensibly fighting against, but is also well, sort of setting the, setting the rules. But at least rules, as yeah. we played, collaboratively, subject to uh, being persuaded that the rules are different than he thought, or yeah, be, be really telling a collective story in which everybody is is a is a participant. Yeah. On the general topic of um, gamification, I feel like it's a sort of an elaborate word for incentive systems. And that what's distinct about um, Dungeons and Dragons um, isn't so much the incentive system, but is is the idea that that it's human mediated. So there's a vital difference to me between a very elaborate Dungeons and dry, dry, you know fantasy style computer game like uh, World of Warcraft and Dungeons and Dragons, and the difference is that the heart of it isn't an algorithm, but it's a person. Yeah. And uh, and this. This completely changes the character of, of the activity. But let's bring that around to law for a moment. There are definitely different conceptions of the law for which one is, it's not self-executing, so you do need people, say judges and others, to make it happen, but that we hope they are constrained by the law. In Massachusetts recently, it made big headlines because of, I think, willful misrepresentation of what was happening. But there was activity on a subway that by all lights uh, many think ought to be illegal for which the statute just was not particularly on point for which the Massachusetts Supreme Court was like, the statute's not on point. Legislature, you know, you want to amend the law, which they then did, go ahead. Um, so I'm just wondering, is that an instance in the application of law where one takes refuge in the rules and algorithms and expects the judge not to use license to deviate? 
or is what you're saying it's better to expect the judge no, think, to kind of I go think, wobbly? You know, in, in, in my ex limited experience in these things, there are very distinctly two categories of judges, right? Yeah. There, are, there are the ones who are the you know literalists, and the rules are the rules, and and uh, and. And then there are the, the people who are more into ideas of justice and making the rules serve some, some other purpose. Yeah. And, uh, and you can tell who you're talking to most of the time if, if you're in, in a courtroom. Yeah. Um, and, and these mapped almost directly to our little groups of Dungeons and Dragons players. We had, we had the, the, the one group who, who read the rules one way. Yes. And to me, it would be phenomenally boring to play the game with these people. Yeah. And, uh, and then there was our group. Again, they, you've made your allegiances clear. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they would never want to play with us because they just like, you know, like they, they were vaguely disdainful of the sort of degrees of success of our characters. And uh -huh. you know, we kind of, we were playing like a superhero game and, and they, they, they thought that was just yes. horror, an abomination, frankly. Yes. Um, but whatever, that's how it goes. <laughs> Let me, oh yeah, one more comment and then we'll put it over to Ethan to wrap us up. Well, I think one interesting thing um, is that I think D&D really teaches you this, and I'm a practicing lawyer, and you, you definitely see it in the law, is that when you get a certain level of mastery of rules, they're not constraining. There's actually freedom there. And that, in a way, you can, you're can you not just telling a story pushing against nothing. There's friction. And you're telling a story with rules, and that makes it all that much of a better story. And I find that when a brief is really working, it kind of has that type of flavor. Uh, where you're, you have your facts and you have your story you want, and you have the, the kind of ideas that the judge wants to get to, but at the same time you're weaving in all the rules that you have to deal with, like I'm an IP attorney, so um, like the rules of obviousness for patent lawsuits, that weaves right into the story if you're doing it right and you can a lot of times tell if you're going to win if the story sounds like it's good and the rules don't seem like they're, you're fighting against them, but they're rather helping you tell the story. Um, so I think that that's, I mean, D&D, it's straight pulled from there and from all these other types of very rule-intense games um, right to the law. It would be interesting to see law schools trying to recruit out of the D&D tournaments. <laughs> uh, you know, they try to get them younger and younger. Well, sort of the role-playing the role side of it, the, 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 you know, making your argument, we talked about that earlier. And, and the idea that the, the, my brief one experience in, in a courtroom for a week, uh, I had my first experience uh, in a, on a jury uh, earlier this winter. And I was astounded by, you know, again, my... You showed up in the jury room with a 20-sided exactly tie. Exactly. Like, You're like, how we're going to do it. defendant feeling lucky today? Yeah. <laughs> um, I know. That would be nice. Um, Turns the, out, under the U.S. Constitution, if it were revealed that this had been used to decide the outcome of the case, no mistrial. Great. We can go back and... <laughs> <laughs> See? The law works. Well, there was a... there was a Tanner v. U.S. Someone did un uncover a 20-sided something that was used in a... a I think it goes back to actually ancient Egypt. So someone has made it, a, a, these do go back in history. Um, but I was just thinking about what you were saying in your comment, the idea that, um, you know, when I was in the courtroom, I was thinking about, well, I've, I've heard the facts of the case. There's the law that we're supposed to abide by and apply to this case. But that what you, at least as a juror, as a neophyte in that experience, you know, which I was astounded was not at all like law and order. And I was waiting for that dong dong sound. I never heard that. Uh, none of that was, that was the case. Uh, that the the narrative, you know, the way in which the lawyer, you know, the, the prosecuting attorney or the you know defense people were 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 shaping the 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 story in the end, particularly I, I suspect, particularly in a, in a criminal case, because it's so much about you are there, putting you there in the room with them. This is what happened, you know. Did in, in our particular uh, case, it was the a very uh, troubling one about a domestic abuse case, and the the argument was had the uh, defendant actually tried to choke his wife or not? And was she close to death? Or was it just that he assaulted her, but she wasn't close to death? That, that way, the, 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 the charge of attempted murder either was or wasn't going to fly based on whether we believed the, the, both attorneys' arguments of that. And it was fascinating. Again, maybe this is where my D&D &D brain came into this, thinking about you know, the tide turns. You know, day one, it's like, oh, it looks like they're going to win. Oh, d you know, day two. And it is a kind of a campaign. And each day, there's more to the story that gets added. And then, and then later, there's sort of summations of the story. And you get to kind of, and then, of course, the la, you know, closing arguments, like, OK, here's your last chance to kind of tie all the threads together. And, and some of those skills, how well do you tell the story, has a huge uh, impact on the way we experience it. Because it is about empathy, right? It is about identification. It is about you know, making the, the story feel real. So what verdict feel did the it. jury return? It was a complicated one because the, there were about 10 different um, uh, charges uh, ranging from violation of a restraining order Got it. to assault 
to um, stalking um, to the attempted murder. So uh, the defendant ended up being found guilty on some and, and not on the others. And did the uh, jury room deliberations feel like uh, twelve angry men? The, well, I was going to say <laughs> being around the table to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. And, and interestingly enough, I mean, there's obviously a foreman, but there's there, there's oftentimes you know the person sort of takes control. There's people who have experience, people who don't have experience. There's some who weigh in with a kind of more emotional. Yes. Response to what happens, and some who weigh in with a more kind of well, no, let's look at the law. Let's look at what the judge told us. Right. Let's you know, and that's just a reflective of I think yes, people's brains. You know, the yeah. way that what, what what appeals to them. Yeah. Um, and I think in the same way, you know, whatever D and D is life. Life is D and D, and there's a lot of things you can say are like yeah. uh, a lot of experiences in life that we have that, that teach us things later. Yes. Whether you played sports, whether you um, you know were on the chess team, whether you were in band camp, whatever it was. All these different things have a formative, have a way of of, of creating uh, um, skills and 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 personality traits and and aspects of, of of your personality that that get expressed mostly in positive ways later. Um, and and for me, it happened to be happened to be D and D. So parting lesson for us. Parting lesson. Um, yeah, where's my fifteen lessons? I don't know if I can get it back up there. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I one of the things that I've discovered in 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 writing this book and in thinking about D and D in particular, about the 40th anniversary and talking to people is how much a weirdly there's interest in D and D again, and it has zero nerd, you know, um, negative baggage attached to it. It's like, oh, that sounds interesting. You know, it used to be something you did and you didn't talk about it very much uh, because you were afraid, as I was, that the jocks are going to beat the crap out of me. Don't ask, don't, don't spell. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> I like it. Um, and, and now it's sort of safe for, for Dean to be out of the closet, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, and I've experienced a lot of curiosity uh, amongst just you know, what I would consider to be non-geeky, gamey, gamey people uh, to participate in this experience because um, like a lot of people my age in particular who look back on where are we now in relation to uh, the 1970s, 1980s, what did we miss along the way? What should have we maybe thought to preserve as we move forward, whether it's our attachment to our devices, whether it's the amount to which technology has you know, brought us together but separates us in other ways. Um, it's a rare moment where we have this opportunity to be around ourselves in person. Uh, this kind of event where we're talking to you and uh, well, some of us were seeing through the, through the screens, but you know, a live event. And uh, and so much of what we how we define our leisure time today is is really defined by, uh, I think, sort of top down. You know, here's a movie, here's a book, here's a blockbuster, here's an internet thing that you need to see now. Um, that the 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 lesson of D and D is sort of no, you 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 make it yourself. Like you have to make your own entertainment. And there's some some pleasure and joy and meaning in making your own entertainment, telling your own story, and 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 I guess. You know, who, who are you going to be? Are you going to be a hero? Are you going to be a bystander? Are you going to, you know, do the right thing at the right moment? Um, uh, there's something very uh, charging or a charged space that I think D&D ignites that is important uh, that we, I hope we don't, you know, lose sight of. Yeah. You know, that we can, we can be uh, our own storytellers and our own, our own entertainers. Um. <clears throat> well, uh, speaking of entertaining, I know Ethan brought some books, so if people want to leave with a memento and something further to chew on, that is sell you possible. One. I can sell you one. Um, and I'll bet you would be willing to dispense advice for those wanting to s try out this. Uh, sure, absolutely, so. yeah. Uh, and, and we can chat informally yes. and obviously help yourself to yes. some of the refreshments. Again, for those of you who are watching at home, sorry, but there's some brownies and cookies, it looks like. And, other things. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, and for this freewheeling uh, conversation, I think it's fair to describe it as chaotic good. This it was, was quite, <laughs> uh, quite good. And we owe you huge thanks well, for coming thank out and for talking uh, with us about it tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks to Jonathan. And, uh, and thanks to Harvard. And, and thanks for making this space available. And um, come on down. Cheers.